Welcome to another special edition of Daily Airline News, looking at the search for MH370. Um, I'm Geoffrey Thomas, and I'm joined today by UK Aerospace Engineer again, Richard Godfrey. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, before we get into the sub today's subject, which is why didn't we find a debris field for MH370? Um, let's have a look at where Amada 7806 is right now. And to do that, uh, Richard, you've done some, uh, you've had a look at it and there's been a couple of changes. Yes, yeah, Samada 7806 is now uh, just over 300 nautical miles away from the MH370 search area. Um, during um, the night, it had to take some avoiding action. There are a lot of uh, Chinese fishing vessels uh, in, in the, this area, and uh, Amada 7806 uh, almost stopped at one point and uh, took uh, uh, avoiding action to avoid fishing lines or fishing nets. In the search area uh, where MH370 uh, will be searched for with uh, AUVs, uh, back in 2018, the fishing vessels and their nets were were quite a problem, and uh, it appears that uh, there are a large number of uh, Chinese fishing vessels in the search area currently, and uh, there was a change of course uh, during the night. Uh, Amada 7806 is now taking a more easterly course and heading for the uh, IG uh, high priority area um, currently, which is a bit further north than the Blely Marchand um, hotspot and, and proposed search area. So I hope that uh, Ocean Infinity are, f are free to search where they want to and are not hindered by uh, these fishing vessels. Look, indeed, and uh, certainly there's a large number of them there. It's uh, quite extraordinary how many that there are uh, on location. So, yes, we certainly hope that uh, those vessels and their nets and lines don't uh, don't interfere with this uh, search. Um, but moving on, you know, we've had a lot of feedback from people about we didn't have a debris field for MH370, um, the traditional traditional, debris field, if you like, that we had with Air France 447 or with the Swiss Air MD-11 that crashed at Nancy's Cove. Um, so we're going to look at that in detail. And, and Richard, the, the, the first thing we're going to look at is the vast area that was involved. Yeah, the Indian Ocean is uh, 70.6 million square kilometres. Uh, so it's a huge uh, area. Uh, so obviously, to conduct a search, you need uh, specific information of where a plane might have crashed. Unfortunately, in the case of MH370, uh, the transponder was switched off and the, the tracking of the aircraft uh, uh, through the normal um, satellite connection was not uh, possible. Uh, so what we know is that it continued to fly for for seven hours and 38 minutes, uh, but uh, precisely where it went in that time was uh, not uh, known at the time of the surface uh, search. The other point I make is the Australian a search and, and rescue uh, region um, covers one tenth of the Earth's surface. Uh, it is a huge area of 54 million square kilometers. 85% of that is uh, ocean. Um, so the vast area represents a major challenge. And talking of challenges, there were other challenges indeed. Um, and perhaps you can talk to those. Um, uh, one of them was the weather. Yeah, the, the um, 
the weather passing through the search area during the 42 days they conducted the surface uh, search was uh, included, I think, three different fronts uh, passing through. And uh, the, the weather was certainly a challenge. The remote location and actually getting there with aircraft and uh, with uh, ships was uh, another uh, challenge. And uh, I mean, initially, Malaysia thought the aircraft crashed in the South China Sea. And then they updated that to the uh, Malacca Strait. Uh, and only when Imasat came out with their data that the flight had continued for seven hours, 38 minutes, did uh, the focus then move uh, to the Indian Ocean. And obviously in seven hours, a um, uh, plane can travel uh, a, a long way. So we got a, a huge area, we got a, a weather challenge, um, and there were many other challenges because as the situation unfolded, the specific location uh, kept on changing. Um, initially, it was assumed uh, that the plane just flew in a straight line as far as it possibly could, and so they were down at 40 degrees south. Uh, then they had a what they thought was an uh, an emergency locator detection, but that was 2,000 kilometers further north. Um, and uh, the uh, aerial search was uh, conducted by a large n number of aircraft. There were 345 flights in total, and they were going uh, to all of these locations to try and find the debris mm. field. And one of the interesting things, too, is that um, where we now believe MH370 is located, the actual surface search didn't start in that broad area until uh, 20 days after it was lost. So any debris field, and there would have been, there would have been a debris field, any debris field uh, would have been dispersed um, with tw uh, with 20 days of drifting, plus, of course, uh, during that time, two of those three fronts that you refer to had gone through the area and um, dispersed the debris even further. So it's not really surprising at all that the traditional debris field wasn't found. Yes, uh, not surprising at all. However, Debris, floating debris was spotted. Yes. Um, for example, uh, a Royal New Zealand uh, Orion uh, search aircraft on the 28th of March uh, spotted what looked like uh, a flaperon uh, floating uh, on the uh, water's uh, surface. They fly in low, uh, 600 feet above the water, they've got uh, forward-looking cameras uh, and uh, infrared. Uh, so they they picked that up on um, their, their screens and, uh, and they picked up a number of other items uh, in the following days in the, in the same area. So they believed they had actually found a debris field. However, mm. when the ships got to that spot uh, several days later, um, the debris had moved on and uh, mm. taken by the currents and the eddies and the waves um, uh, further afield. So nothing was actually ever recovered uh, from the surface search uh, and nothing was then identified as being um, from MH370. Yet, of course, we, as we all know, and as we have reported, 43 pieces of debris have turned up um, on the other side of the Indian Ocean, which is where the current would take it. Um, and uh, we're showing viewers now a, uh, a list of all the debris that's been found. And also, uh, as well as that, uh, we're, we're also showing you a, a few of the pieces that have been recovered uh, in that time. 
Now, also, Richard, they launched some drifters as well, and they're called marker boys uh, to study how the debris would would have travelled. Yes, a total of um, 33 of these self-locating marker boys were launched. Uh, They're launched out of the back of uh, an aircraft passing overhead. Uh, Each of these 33 boys was uh, tracked for 21 days, so they had a very good picture of how uh, floating debris would uh, drift uh, in that area. By the end of the 42 days of searching, day 52 after the crash of uh, MH370, the estimated area where debris could possibly have drifted to was a huge 3.6 million uh, square kilometers. So, you know, the proverbial, we're looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, in this case, it was a few needles in a haystack the size of half of Australia. Um, Mm -hmm. So the challenge uh, was um, enormous. And uh, it's no wonder, in my mind, that no debris field was found uh, for MH370. Look, indeed, and um, I know we've covered this before in in, in a previous um, special edition of uh, the search for MH370. There will be debris uh, on the ocean floor, and that will be things like undercarriage, engines, uh, the, the main body of the wing, the main body of the fuselage. There will be a lot of debris on the ocean floor, um, what we're talking about with the floating debris, uh, the very lightweight parts, the the things that will float like carbon fiber panels, and uh, that's that's the difference in the in in the types of debris you get from from an aircraft crash. It's getting very exciting, Richard. Amada seventy eight oh six will be in the search area tomorrow. Correct. Indeed, it's three hundred nautical miles away. Uh, making about uh, 10 knots. So uh, 300 nautical miles at 10 knots is 30 uh, hours uh, yeah. away from this, the search area. So it'll get there um, sometime later tomorrow. And one would expect that uh, they will start searching uh, on Monday. Yeah, so I think uh, they will use the local um local time daylight hours uh, for launch and for recovery operations of, of their AUVs. Um, but uh, yeah, they have obviously uh, with the moon pools on board the Armada 7806 and the, the deck lighting, uh, they have the capability of doing uh, 24-7 uh, mm. operations. And I think they'll be trying to do that because, uh, you know, while the weather has abated at the moment, um, we are moving into um, in, into autumn in the southern hemisphere, and we will start to get a few uh, strong cold fronts coming through in the next uh, month or so. So it's probably timely to get those southern hotspots out of the road before they move further north. The other fact is that. Um the normal operational insurance of Amada 7806 is 35 days. Um, it's already been a, um, a number of days at sea. It will have about 15 days in the search area before it has to head for a port like uh, Fremantle in Australia or another port nearby. Mm. It might uh, it might head to Geraldton, um, but more likely Perth. Um, and we'll see. But uh, so that sort of segues into tomorrow's ed- edition of the search for MH370. And we're going to have a really good look at the capability, the amazing capability of the Hugen 6000 and uh, all the kit it has on board um, and, and what it can do and what it can see. Um, so that'll be tomorrow. So do tune in for that. And thank you very much, Richard, for joining me again um, on this now becoming a regular spot. And thank you also to the viewers um, for your tremendous support, uh, very encouraging words, 
and and ideas and suggestions. Uh, that's all, all all good stuff. So please do subscribe to us. Please like us and uh, leave those comments. And please do tune in tomorrow for another edition. And again, Richard, thank you for your time and your research into this absolutely fascinating subject. You're welcome.